Okay, I, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess I, before I should start, can everyone hear me? Coming through okay? Perfect. So as I said, good afternoon. I'm honored to provide the welcoming remarks on behalf of StreetCred for, for the premiere of Harm, Alberta's preventable overdose crisis, how we got here and how we get out. My name is Stephen Richardson and I'm the core program coordinator for StreetCred. StreetCred is a program within the O'Brien Institute and our mission is to provide a healthy community by networking and coordinating with diverse stakeholders who, through collaboration, drive initiatives that benefit socially and structurally marginalized populations in Calgary. Today's premiere of Harm reflects our mission and goals. Before I introduce the panelists and filmmakers, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territory of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Sitsika, Pakani, and Kainai Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nation. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Please note that today's webinar will be recorded and published online. In the event that we're not able to answer all of your questions, we will provide the panelists and filmmakers with the outstanding questions to answer following the event. If you have any follow-up questions, contact IPH at ucalgary.ca. Also, let's continue the conversation online and feel free to spread the word using the following hashtags and handles. So today we have Dr. Bonnie Larson, Dr. Katrina Mulaney, and Chanel Tuan joining us on the panel. Dr. Bonnie Larson is the lead for street credit at the O'Brien Institute. Dr. Larson has made significant contributions to harm reduction practices and the overdose epidemic we are currently experiencing by identifying the urgent public health implications of provincial policies impacting harm reduction programs and supervised consumption services, and the need to engage service providers and community stakeholders in developing local responses. Dr. Katrina Mullaney is an Associate Professor of in Community Rehabilitation and Disability Studies at the University of Calgary. Dr. Mullaney is a qualitative and mixed method researcher who uses critical theory frameworks to study socially vulnerable populations related to disabilities, homelessness, gender, culture, domestic violence, and mental health. Chanel Tuan is an outreach worker and the core team supervisor at Streetworks, a harm reduction program in Edmonton operated by Boyle Street. Chanel is also the facilitator of the local Edmonton chapter of AWARE. Additionally, we are also lucky enough to have both filmmakers of harm with us today. Dr. Da Dr. Jason Lejoy, is a research associate for the University of Waterloo's Council for Responsible Innovation and Technology. Jason's current research focuses on inclusive, ethical, and sustainable approaches to technological innovation in academia and industry. And he has published and he, is, and he has published research that emerge, engages with queer theory, critical making, and research. Uh, pardon me, research creation methodologies. Uh, Dr. Jason Ng Kamstra is, is an acute care surgeon and intensivist with a research interest in health equity and health system. He trained in general surgery at the University of Toronto and critical care medicine at the University of Calgary and will also be our moderator at today's event. Thank you to the panelists and Jason and Josh for joining us today. As a note, before we hand it over to Jason, the documentary was filmed before the beginning of the pandemic. So if you see groups of people unmasked at demonstrations, that is the reason why. Jason, I'll hand it over to, over to you to begin. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the O'Brien Institute for organizing this event and for allowing us to share our film with you today. And I'd also like to acknowledge those we've lost to opioid poisoning in Alberta and in Canada more broadly. Each person has a unique story and it's critical that we don't lose sight of that when we talk about the statistics of this second pandemic. And just like COVID-19, we know that the opioid epidemic can affect anyone in society, but some groups are harder hit than others. I lost my brother Lucas to fentanyl poisoning in Calgary in 2014, before we had the official nomenclature of a fentanyl crisis. And it took me years to find the space and support to explore what led to his death and the health policy context that surrounded it. And as I learned more about the opioid epidemic, I came to see that the greatest tragedy of his death was in how achingly familiar it was becoming for many Canadians. In the years since Lucas died, the situation has only grown more critical affecting Canadians from coast to coast. 
The provincial reporting of opioid related deaths in 2020 is not yet finished, but from the available data, we know that over 5,200 Canadians died from opioid toxicity last year. And that is more than double the number of deaths from motor vehicle collisions. And without swift and deliberative action from government, the healthcare community and the public, more lives will be lost and more families devastated. The questions that drove this documentary you are about to see were first, how did we fail to connect the dots for so long? And second, why did we fail to listen to the pleas of those struggling around us? And every day that we don't address these questions, we see their consequences in the lives lost due to overdose, in the families destroyed, and in the millions spent each year on inefficient and even harmful drug treatment policies that keep this crisis locked on its rising trajectory with 11 Canadians dying each day due to overdose. So thank you for taking the time today to join us. And I hope that this event will contribute to a long-standing and vital conversation about the overdose crisis in Alberta. Thank you. When we look at substance use disorder, what is effective? Is effective 100% sobriety? Well, we're gonna lose that, right? That's never gonna be a thing that we get. So if instead harm reduction sort of challenges us and says, well, what do we view as our outcomes that are meaningful? And traditionally it's been, you know, binary, like they stopped drinking, they stopped using fentanyl, they stopped using meth, and it's, they never use it again, and they never touch it again in their entire lives. We're gonna, most people will fail that. Like I would fail that, like almost anyone would fail that. Um, versus harm reduction says, okay, so can we get them to use safer? You're gonna win with that. You're going to be effective with that. So it helps you redefine what success is. sort of the surrounding effect of like increased activity and perceived risk around this site downtown. If we have more that are dispersed across the city in places that are needed, then you know it'll really help to take the pressure off of the single site that we have. Really we're hoping that they're going to maintain and expand the supervised consumption services and all harm reduction services that we have in Calgary, but the fear is very much that it looks like they're going to go in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, that's going to cost the lives of Albertans. My name is Kim Porter, and this is my son, Neil Balmer. Um, I'm here foremost in support of those lives that have been lost to the crisis, because I believe that this is a crisis of humanity, and I think we've lost our way. At a, uh, I think at a really pivotal point where the people that have the power needs to make some big decisions and understanding that not all Canadians will agree with the decisions that need to be made. But the reality is no one's ideology should be more important than another person's life. It's really frustrating to 
to understand the process of addiction and see how that affects people's lives and see how like, it really, really, really is not a choice. Um, and then to just have people just rip, just rip hard. And like, nobody, nobody else in society do we get to rip on as hard as we do people with addictions and get away with it. I was a mother, I was married and had two, two children. I was at that time a, public, a soccer coach, a fundraiser. I, I was waitressing, uh, happy, uh, a singer. I played guitar. I, I taught myself guitar. So, but I, I, I had a little, I had some stuff going on. There were some underlying issues within my marriage. And um, I guess, you know, I didn't realize that I was heading for, for a trail of addiction. My marriage started to break down. And I, I wanted to fix everybody. I wanted to be that person that um, that was there for everybody else, but I wasn't there for myself. I didn't know how, how to fix me. Just trying to wrap my head around this. Oh my gosh, I'm homeless. They've, they've taken my kids. And they think that they're helping me, but they're not. They, I, I've been dropped off in the eye of the hurricane, in the worst possible place that you could put a person who's just started to use. Uh, this is addiction central, right? This is where everybody is hardcore addict. There is no getting out now. So fortunately, there are a lot of barriers in place that prevent people who have opioid use disorder from seeking treatment or really getting the help that they want. So first of all, the treatment itself is hard to find. And second of all, people are apprehensive or scared frequently about engaging in it. And third of all, when it comes to opioid use treatment, unfortunately for many years, we've looked at it as something that we can force or coerce or punish people into and that, that hasn't worked. We know the more successful treatments but they're a rarity, are the ones that really hold people up, support them, and help them along. We're not opposed to harm reduction as part of the continuum of care uh, for people facing uh, drug addictions, but we must place a much bigger emphasis on uh, opportunities for detox, treatment, and recovery. The Canadian guidelines, as well as most international guidelines, clearly state that detoxification, or taking people off of opioids, without putting them on to medication-assisted treatment or opioid agonist treatments is unsafe and doesn't produce good results. So I think we have healthcare systems that are designed to meet the needs of the majority of the population. And we have a very small group of people with many multiple comorbid conditions, including mental health and addiction issues. And so we have to be a little bit more creative with that small group of people um, because they do disproportionately take up healthcare dollars because we're not serving and meeting their needs appropriately. So we create these systems for the masses and then we try to just jam every round peg into that square hole and it just doesn't work. So I think that we just, we need to be a little bit more creative about how we engage with folks, what we can include as far as those wraparound supports, put our agenda aside, identify how we can get this person to an improved health and who else do we need to include in that, including the patient. We don't have the ability here to waste any more time. The reality is that people are, are continuing to die, people are continuing to lose their lives, and there's not a reprieve in sight right now just because of the way our current drug policy exists. It takes effort to go out and find unused needles and unused supplies to use. It's, it's not as simple as just having a drawer full at home. The population I see, they don't have homes. So every time they want to inject, as an example, they have to go find an unused supplier. They have to access a safe consumption site. It takes a lot of work. And to view it as, well, you're not sober, so it's failure, is to completely disregard all the hard work that they put in to make those healthy choices for themselves. It, it can't just look like one thing. It can't just look like abstinence because you leave out all these other people. And that's when the shame comes in. It's like, oh, well, I can't do it that way. And that's the only right way to do it. So I must not be able to do it at all. We look at a person as just that initial problem that they're presenting with or that initial concern that they're presenting with. Um, and that's how we define them. We define them as that person in room two with diabetes or the diabetic person in room two, right? Like 
we don't really look at uh, within healthcare. We don't look at that person as a person first. In medicine, uh, the misconception I think it still still runs deep that it is still a failure to see it as what it is is a relapsing chronic disease. So on the far left hand side, you have methadone into suboxone. And then you get into uh, specialized treatments like Cadian. Now we have Sublocade, which is an injectable suboxone. And then as you move from left to right, the, the treatments get more intense. And I'm probably on the furthest right hand side of that spectrum of, of care from left to right would be something like IO. So with IOT, um, those are people with severe opiate use disorder. So those are people who inject their opiates. Typically they've been injecting for years and years and years. We wouldn't start anyone on IOT who's not already injecting opiates. We wouldn't start anyone at IOT who um, is smoking their fentanyl but injecting meth. It's really they have to be injecting opiates because we're not going to start that. Because ideally we do want to stabilize someone on oral medication. By the time a patient ends up on IOT or injectable opioid agonist therapy, They've tried a lot of different treatments. For most healthcare providers, we'd prefer not to have them on an injectable opioid agonist. But the reality is that for most of these people who've ended up at this point, at this time, there are no other good options. Once the clients find out that the program won't be offered anymore, you just lose them back to their prior patterns of, of where they came from before the program. And that's back to the streets and homelessness, and back to the toxic supply and probable increases in overdose. Because the streets are hard and they're cold and they're dark and it's evil. Very, the best way I could describe that is being in a war zone. Like serious PTSD, like you were in a war zone. Absolute trauma, 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 day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out, that I used to cope, to, to just stop, to stop crying every single day. I, I just, and the shock and the depravity of, oh my God, I just can't even wrap my head around what I'm seeing every single day. It is the most crazy, dark side of life that you could ever possibly imagine. It's important for people who are on injectable opioid treatments to be easily moved onto other, more standard, and what we call first-line treatments when they're ready or when they're able to. These things are less burdensome and less costly. And for most providers, that's what we want to see. But the reality is that trying to force them out of an IOP program too quickly is just going to result in death, overdose, and suffering. We don't believe that, that the government giving people who are coping with addictions free drugs is a solution to the problem of drug addiction. They want to move away from a harm reduction model to a more of a treatment-based model, and I can't really think of a better treatment than this. Medications, uh, peer support, Housing, 100%. We, we need more housing. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. I can't think of a better, perhaps, treatment than to introduce a medical structure with attached programs, with various supports, with a clean supply. What we want to make sure is that the healthcare system and, and all the tax dollars that are invested in it are used the best they can. Not only does it mean that applying a full spectrum of medication assisted treatment or all the different options of opioid agonist treatment all the way to injectable opioid agonist treatment or IO should be available. But it also means using the right treatment for the right person at the right time. Using the wrong treatment on the wrong person not only doesn't work, it wastes money. The person doesn't get better and the treatment itself and the time and money you've put into it goes away. So pairing people with what they need at the time they need it is crucial not only to save lives, improve health, but really to make sure that the healthcare system works efficiently and saves taxpayer dollars as much as it can. 
I think the stressors um, that come for me, the majority of them come from mainstream folks who may not understand harm reduction and may see it as enabling um, or being okay, you know, just, you know, let's everybody have a free for all and that's not the reality. The reality is we know that an 11 cent needle can prevent a case of, you know, a case of HIV that might end up costing the healthcare system $1.3 million. The hardest part of my job is people who don't get it. It's the stigma that's in society because it's so frustrating. And we deliberately shame and stigmatize people. It's cultural. It's what we do in this um, society if they use drugs. And no matter how they got there, it's like decontextualized completely. What if recovery for someone looks like, I got on methadone, I no longer sell drugs, I have a place to live, I'm eating. What if that's recovery for them? I've seen people stabilized. Long-term homelessness, people are housed. We see people that are, are stable. They have a, a stable floor under them. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. You're worth it. Your life can change. I know this. Why do I know this? Because I had absolutely no idea how good life could be until I started to work on me. Maybe this change is small and maybe that's okay. And maybe that looks like, you know, calling her mom. Like, uh, you know what, I mean? it can be the littlest thing that really means something big to someone. So I am always going off of what, what, what do you want? And they go to get help and, and nobody will help them. And they get treated very, very badly. And then, and that teaches people because we're human beings and we're conditionable and that we don't somehow deserve that help. When you layer that on potentially trauma from people's lives, um, it is this vicious circle that happens where then people feel like they're not worthy of that help because they're treated poorly and they, again, they're going back to uh, hide and that causes people to die in the era of a contaminated drug supply. Every single person in healthcare is somebody's mother, brother, sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, there's somebody. Yeah, there's a personal cost. It's hard to watch people die, um, especially people that you have, you know, you know them. You've been to their house. Most of the time you've met their family or their baby or, you know, there's, you care about someone, but there's no greater feeling when something really clicks and someone like does better for themselves and then they come back. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to the film, including those who, who aren't with us at today's premiere. This is indeed a true crisis and we need to address it as such. Um, if you're on social media, we're keeping this discussion going today um, uh, with the hashtag harmfilmyyc. Um, so if you wanna contribute online, um, uh, perhaps we can get the attention of, uh, of policymakers and, and, the, and the news media. So we have a, a really fantastic panel here today to discuss the film. Uh, Steve introduced everyone at the beginning, uh, but you'll recognize a couple of the faces from the film itself. 
Uh, so I'll open up the discussion by asking each of the panelists a question, but this is really meant to be a discussion. So if, uh, if the conversation develops organically in another direction, we'll follow as well. So to start and to really get to the core of this issue, focusing on harm reduction, we'll start with Dr. Mullaney. Uh, so Dr. Mullaney, in some of your recent work, you spoke with, uh, with hundreds of individuals from around Alberta as part of the Alberta Health and Drug Use Survey. And although uh, through the film we've seen, uh, this is a complex issue, there are some common themes which emerged in the needs of Albertans who use drugs. So what does a harm reduction approach mean for these Albertans and what happens when these services are no longer available? Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for inviting me to participate today. Um, so yes, we met with uh, over 800 um, Albertans and this is prior to the opening of uh, supervised consumption clinics and as the community naloxone program was uh, unfolding. And so that's just a little bit of context around when uh, we talked to folks. but. Uh, several issues emerged, uh, which, you know, really parallel what we heard in the film. One of the biggest issues was uh, really limited access to good health care and to medical care. Lots of people that we talked to had been turned away from mainstream health care clinics, um, from acute care units. Uh, and from their perspectives, it was because they were um, drug users. So they were reliant, uh, often reliant on emergency health responses when they had a health crisis. And this is an expensive uh, way to deal with this issue and it's very ineffective. Um, it also meant most of the people that we had met uh, had not ever been able to access supports for their addictions or for their use, uh, which many of them wanted. And so uh, a lot of people told us they'd never been asked about their drug use, uh, how it started, why it started, or even uh, what options might be available to them. So when we asked them what kinds of services they wanted the most, 63% uh, of people said they wanted support for their addiction. 83% uh, said they wanted support for their health issues, um, physical and mental health issues. 72% did not have access to housing. And almost 80% said uh, they actually wanted referrals to treatment programs. Um, they all said they would use a supervised consumption clinic and felt that the non-judgmental approach that is embedded in the principles and the practice within these clinics would mean they could for the first time for many people have access to health and addiction supports. Um, I think it's really important though to ground this issue in the root cause. And from my perspective and from my work, uh, you know, the most of the people that I've met have very long histories of trauma, most of them starting in childhood. And substance use or drug use actually started as a way to cope with that childhood abuse. Um, and in some cases, uh, extreme violence and even sexual exploitation. And so these issues don't go away, even if the abuse stops. And dependency quickly can become a full-blown addiction because substances are highly addictive. They're highly toxic, especially right now. Um, and because the underlying trauma has never been dealt with. So to answer the question, a harm reduction approach, in my opinion, means options. It means providing a full spectrum or continuum of services that support people where they're at and, and with what they need. Um, and that includes things like getting off dangerous opioids through replacement medications, providing a safe place to connect with staff where they won't be judged, uh, where the conversation can start uh, about their needs um, and how to start getting connected to supports. And I think the biggest issue that we're facing right now, I, I don't know if folks know, but today's the provincial budget day. So, um, big things I think are gonna, are gonna happen that have implications. And I think a lot of people have become preoccupied with supervised consumption clinics as a place that condone and support drug use. Um, and these clinics are, are often the very first place where people have access to healthcare and to the options that may be out there for them. So when we don't have these services, the problem of drug use doesn't go away. In fact, it limits our capacity to respond to this crisis and can actually make the problem worse. Thanks for that. Again, uh, what the one thing that I really learned through this whole process was that um, the, that we really need to divorce the ideology from the science here. Um, uh, the notion of harm reduction as sort of a, a liberal philosophy goes against what we know about it as, as a cost saving measure in the long term. Um, uh, when people want and, and receive access to high quality care. Um, so now I wanted to turn to, uh, uh, to Ms. Tuan. Um, 
because you have a bit of a different perspective um, at um, at Streetworks, and you've worked with with countless Albertans um, uh, to help them find uh, space and support. Uh, so, what does a harm reduction approach look like for the people you work with, um, uh, and what happens when when these services are no longer available, especially during the context of uh, of a health emergency, another health emergency like the COVID-19 pandemic. Absolutely. Thank you, Josh. Um, absolutely. I'd, I'd just like to um, uh, thank Dr. Milani for her remarks um, because everything is absolutely on point and um, I would just absolutely second everything that she said in regards to a harm reduction response in community. Um, so really a harm reduction response um, for us in community, it, it really looks multi-pronged. And so um, the reality is there are a plethora of uh, activities that include um, that harm reduction uh, includes. And so this would be like needle exchange, condom distribution, overdose prevention training, uh, managed alcohol programs, um, peer support, drug substitutions. Um, but most importantly, I would probably say IOT and supervised consumption sites. Um, these are uh, when they are not available in communities um, that we have seen in Alberta. Um, the reality is, again, that um, Albertans are dying daily. Um, when people don't have access, like Dr. Milani uh, had pointed out, um, the reality is um, very grim and stark for folks. Um, and so for folks who might not be familiar with um, I mean, I can see here we have 216 participants, but folks who might not be uh, quite familiar, um, I would just actually like to share with everybody the harm reduction definition um, that Streetworks has come up with. Um, and so hopefully this kind of in, in encompasses a lot of uh, the things we'd like to get across. And so harm reduction is a comprehensive, just and science-based approach to substance use and its principles can pertain to activities such as sex work that represents policy, policies, strategies, and services which aim to assist people who use legal and illegal psychoactive drugs to live safer and healthier lives. Harm reduction recognizes that people use drugs for many reasons, and the reduction of substance use and or absence is not required to receive respect, compassion, or services. Policy and practice must reflect these realities. Harm reduction enhances the ability of people who use substances to have increased control over their lives and their health and allows them to take perfect protective and proactive measures for themselves, their families and their communities. Harm reduction is based on evidence, both from science and lived experience, and it is rooted in compassion and justice. It challenges stigma and discrimination and includes the meaningful involvement of people who use substances. So, and also recognizes that all substances have both positive and negative effects and substance use may affect one's health and legal vulnerability. It is clear that most people who use substances do not experience problems, but in some circumstances, substance use became, can become dependent and or chaotic. It addresses policies and laws that create risk environments and harm to individuals, communities, and particularly marginalized groups. Harm reduction approaches re reject the notion that the use of criminal law should be the sole response to illicit substance use. It recognizes that the regulation of substances will decrease cost to health, justice, and social systems. It decreases violence. It increases access to prevention, care, treatment, and support services, and decreases barriers. It decreases racial profiling and respects the human rights of people who use substances. It seeks creative solutions that are pragmatic, cost-effective, and uh, sensitive to the available resources, social context, and personal history of individuals. It challenges people to be courageous and think outside of the box, and it promotes thoughtful, balanced, and well-researched approaches to the actual harms of substances and encourages truthful drug education. Uh, it advocates for enhanced and effective treatment options and includes non-judgmental, client-centered, strength-based services and activities that provide the skills, knowledge, and resources and supports for people to live safer and healthier lives. These activities uh, may include, again, needle exchange, condom distribution, overdose prevention, managed alcohol programming, drug substitution, and others, um, but obviously, most importantly, supervised consumption services. So uh, drug use does not encourage drug use, enable harmful drug use, or give up on people. Harm reduction approaches do quite the opposite, increasing access to services and creating a milieu of support for positive change. Um, yeah. Thanks for that, Chanel. It's, it's, it's always nice to have that sort of baseline of understanding of, of what we mean when, uh, when we say harm reduction, because it does mean different things to different people. Um, but I think 
at, at, like you were saying, it, it's it's this really sort of philosophical basis that that underpins um, uh, that underpins effective um, effective support for people with addictions. Um, so I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about something else that that came up um, a few times in the film, uh, really the the stigma that's associated with with drug use. Uh, so this time we'll start with uh, with Dr. Larson. Um, so, Dr. Larson, um, if you could sit down with with all of the physicians in Alberta, what would you want them to know about about your patients, the people that you see um, uh, in your in your harm reduction work, and how can physicians contribute to breaking the cycle of stigma and ill health for for Albertans who use drugs? I'm shuffling papers here a little, little bit because I I think I have my questions out of order. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And hi, everybody. And thanks so much for um, coming today. Great turnout. Uh, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to my co-panelists, uh, Katrina and Chanel, and also um, to Josh and Jason for making this beautiful, very homegrown, very grassroots documentary. Um, I'm so proud of you guys, and I'm so proud of us. And I am so proud of our community for showing up to make the film happen, and also for coming out um, today. So just those comments and then I'll, uh, I'll try to be quick here about with your question around stigma. Um, but yeah, my, my perspective is as a, a family doc um, working in the community and primary care. And so I do understand that there's barriers, you know, to, to getting the same care to my patient population as we do offer the general population. Though often those barriers are very systemic things that aren't really any individual's fault. And, um, you know, yesterday I had a very familiar, all too familiar to me scenario in my exam room where I was talking to a patient who really needed hospital care and, and, and they just couldn't stomach the idea of going to hospital um, where they had been treated poorly in the past. So I told them, I believe them. And, you know, sometimes I hear a very wise person in my mind as I move through my day and that wise person is the Swedish chef from the Muppets who mostly says a lot of things that really don't make any sense at all, like bork, bork, bork. And then suddenly and sagely comes out with something like peoples is peoples. And this is one of those things that makes so much sense, no matter how much nonsense it's packed in between. It's really at the heart of what can and should be internalized by all of us about anyone who's been pushed to the margins of society, peoples is peoples. So specifically what I would like for my colleagues, my medical colleagues, physicians to know is actually less about the patients I work with who are people like anyone else. And it's more about what I would want physicians to know and understand about themselves because that's the difficult and very courageous work of self-examination and reflexive positioning. And it's the relentless pursuit of uncovering our own unconscious biases. Um, and it also demands that we strengthen ourselves to be brave enough to use our voices of power and privilege to chase down and dismantle systemic discrimination. Um, so while there are things that absolutely, you know, we can do as physicians in terms of uh, prescribing, we can't do any prescribing unless we meet people where they're at, unless we can engage. If we're alienating, if we don't understand our own position and our own um, propensities to stigmatize or discriminate in the first place, we are simply going to alienate folks and you will never get a chance to prescribe anything uh, for anybody. And, and so in terms of like the medical piece, it's not pr prescribing medical assisted treatment or Suboxone is, is not rocket science. That's not even the hard part. The hard part is, is doing the engagement in the first place and that's where the state stigma and uh, work comes from and understanding trauma inf trauma informed approach and a harm reduction approach is actually the hardest work of all. So now back to uh, back to Ms. Tuan. So uh, alongside stigma comes racism. Um, and you've previously talked about how anti indigenous racism affects both you and the people you work with. Um, there have been a lot of efforts in Alberta to address racism in the health professions, but it, it persists. 
Um, so what kind of barriers to healthcare do Indigenous people in Alberta continue to face? Um, so you're absolutely right, Josh, um, that Indigenous people uh, to this day in Alberta and Canada continue to face uh, barriers accessing healthcare in Alberta. Um, so to me, um, to follow off of Dr. Larson's comments, to me, really, it is about um, interrupting racism, which coincidentally is the topic coming up at the Alberta College of Family Physicians uh, Medicine Summit that's happening this first weekend in March. Um, so I just want to reiterate um, the same message that I had actually shared to that group via uh, recording. And that is to me, uh, interrupting racism means exactly that. And it means using positions of privilege to do something more impactful uh, and to challenge others to interrupt racism uh, whenever they can on not only on individual levels, but on systemic levels also um, to check yourself uh, and to be open to the idea that change is needed. Um, but to hold folks accountable, not only ourselves, but hold other people accountable. Um, so no more sweeping things under the rug um, and consistently include issues related to race. Um, so encouraging folks to speak, even when their voice shakes, even if they are uh, the only one speaking and to practice interruption. Um, lastly, to know the resources in uh, the community. So in literature, in media, in the front line, um, because you will need those resources, obviously, to ignite change. So I know our time is running short. So I'd like to jump to our last formal topic of discussion because we have a ton of really um, interesting questions coming in online as well. Um, so for the last formal topic, I'd like to talk about the future. Uh, so Dr. Mullaney, you've, you've researched drug policy and its impact on Albertans uh, who use drugs over several successive provincial governments. Um, so based on your research and considering the goals of trying to save lives, improve the quality of life of, of people who use drugs and you know, maximizing economic return as well, uh, what policy changes would you prescribe for Alberta in 2021? What would you like to see in today's budget? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think traditionally policy responses to addiction have been grounded, you know, in a preoccupation with abstinence and even incarceration, so punishment. And the problem is that addiction rates are not going down and health and social issues associated with drug use are getting worse. So what we're doing now in terms of our policy responses uh, simply isn't working. So policy change that's meaningful and relevant and that will actually have the impact that we want needs to be grounded in research and evidence, first and foremost, in my opinion. Um, and public consultation is a, is a tactic that's used often in policy development um, by different governments. And it may be a, a way to engage stakeholders and you know, build public awareness, but data and research that includes the experiences or prioritizes the voices of people who are living with these issues that we're tr trying to solve is the most critical piece. Uh, when we did our study, um, that we talked about already, uh, you know, people told us what they wanted. They wanted housing, they wanted support for their addictions, they wanted health care, uh, they wanted to know what their options were. And they also talked a lot about how they tried to get help and couldn't because of stigma or misunderstandings or judgment. And so in my sort of ideal vision of what we should or could do, because I think we can, um, is, you know, what if instead of closing down harm reduction services, and supervised consumption clinics, we just rebranded them and actually enhanced the services that are available there. Call them addiction and community health clinics and fund them to be embedded and a part of the full continuum services that are out there um, that also need to be enhanced. So I think you, know, you, you still make sure that it's a safe place to access um, for supervised use and to access safe supplies, but also really, um, prioritize a full continuum or holistic model of support services that includes referrals to opioid agonist programs, uh, addictions counselors, housing locators, mental health workers, in addition to the nurses that are already there. And I think um, this could really help make sure people have a safe, non-judgmental place where they have an opportunity, maybe for the first time, to talk about their health and addiction support needs. Uh, and maybe even more importantly, could create a doorway uh, into services and supports to deal with the underlying trauma that we've already talked about that's at the root cause of the issue. So I think the first step to policy change in this case is understanding that addiction is an issue of trauma, not an issue for judgment or punishment. Uh, and if we could imagine that, I think we could imagine a very different response, uh, one that might actually work. 
And that leads into um, one of the questions that actually has a lot of overlap with, with things that have been coming in online, but it's a question for, uh, for Dr. Larson. Um, so Dr. Larson, you started your career as a cult cultural anthropologist. So using an anthropological lens, what would you say are the problematic myths in Alberta around uh, drug use and harm reduction and what sustains them? Um, and what sort of policy narratives has this created and, and what do we do now to, to save lives? Okay, this is an interesting question to me um, because I do think that the way I practice is very deeply informed by my previous career in anthropology and sort of a broad liberal education. Uh, it also, what Dr. Mullaney said about rebranding segues nicely to this because that, that rebranding or reframing is really about um, like the stories we tell in our society. And I think like Alberta, just like every, every place, every society, to greater or lesser, lesser degrees shares identity values and stories. So myths themselves are not inherently problematic um, or beneficial, though they can be both or either, but it's how they're spun that gives them meaning, that gives them some power. And so take the archetype of like the tough independent oil rig worker or rancher or rodeo cowboy, um, very self-efficacious, resourceful, you know, the Alberta cowboy, little need or regard for authority or big government. The values that are re represented by this archetype, this myth might be extolled by like a business owner, a policymaker, and then they weave this story around the fierce independence and the hardworking in order to get ahead. And then if that narrative is knit to a notion that people who use drugs, for example, don't work hard, then that's how they are able to successfully other that individual or group because they're implying a challenge to our collective values and thereby justifying discrimination and ideology rather than evidence-based policy. So another version of that same story is is my version, is how I see things through my, my um, privileged lens of being a family physician, uh, that that tough survivor, that cowboy is actually the patient before me and is a person who is surviving on the streets against all odds, often having spent many years on the rigs or the rodeo circuit, maybe having been injured and who uses drugs. That person also builds, innovates, creates, and works extremely hard day after day. Their problem is not work ethic. The problem is the system and the discriminatory policies around them. So how do you pull up your bootstraps when your feet are bare and cold? The point is that as Albertans, we still have common ground on which to build solutions. And we have this story that is ours alone to write. It's ours. We help each other replace the barn roof and we watch out for our neighbors. And Albertans really do have an intelligent, innovative, entrepreneurial and pioneering spirit that is deeply connected to the land and to each other, which are exactly the traits that we need to stop this crisis. So thank you for that question. So I'd like to now uh, switch over to some uh, some questions from um, uh, from our audience, uh, and the first one is actually for um, uh, for Miss Tuan. Um, so uh, we had discussed um, offline some of the needs of of Albertans uh, who use drugs um, and uh, and how they've evolved over the years, um, but uh, this question is about how things have changed with, with the COVID pandemic. Um, how have the needs of the people that you work with uh, changed in response to COVID over, over 2020 and into today? Yeah, so really the work has shifted um, very much so. So um, previously we were doing things like um, helping 
folks get identification, getting uh, connected to healthcare, income assistance, um, things like that. Um, right now, um, it's really about meeting people's basic needs. So food, clothes, or shelter. shelter um, and um, the reality is um, we now have 24-7 uh, uh, coverage at the one of our supervised consumption sites. Um, and so really it's going back to making sure people have the skills, knowledge, resources, and supports to stay safer and healthier, but more, more importantly, to stay alive. Um, it's really... Um, it's really changed uh, really the focus of the work. And so previously, you know, we would have said food, clothing, shelter are the three biggest things that, you know, the community um, needs. But really right now, the three biggest and greatest needs that lie in the community are safe supply, um, supportive housing, and changes to drug laws, drug policies, which criminalize people and put people in, in very precarious situations. I like this question. It's uh, it's about how people find um, primary care physicians who are open to accepting and understanding patients uh, who are using drugs or are on on um, uh, uh, medication assisted therapy. Uh, how do people go about finding a physician like that? Is there a list available somewhere, or or could that be uh, something that could be created? Maybe Bonnie. <laughs> I wish there was a list. Um, there, there isn't to date, but I do. I can say that the ACFP, like the Alberta College of Family Physicians, has been working. Um, I've been part of the ta their task force since they sort of got on it early. And there is a mentorship network that. Um, so any family doc can uh, ask for mentorship. Can be a mentor if you are experienced. And or ask for mentorship. Say you have a patient. You, you know, you, most of your patients aren't necessarily um, with opioid use disorder, but you have a few, and you're not so comfortable. You can have a mentor through the ACFP program. So, and that's I think it's important for the community to know that too, because if patients themselves are sometimes our patients bring the resources to us, right? And so and educate us. So if you um, took that, if a person took that resource to their family doc and, and said, hey, did you know if I, I mean, it, it requires a lot, you know, sort of being proactive, but which is not, you know, a hierarchy of needs. But if that's possible, that's one way to do it. Otherwise, asking around sort of the community in the inner cities and so on, that excludes um, folks who are more rural or with less resources, unfortunately. But, you know, it, it is a very good question and a good point. What I would like to say about that, and I know this is idealistic and it doesn't, it's not very practical, but at the moment, what I would like to say is that all family doctors should be, you know, responding to their patients needs, their community needs and the rates of overdoses and opioid use disorder right now are extremely high. It is, it begs the question as to why people aren't preparing themselves. It's not hard to provide Suboxone, for example, or, um, you know, we think of safe supply as being only a policy issue. It's, it's not, it's also a clinical issue. And we prescribe all kinds of medications off label for all kinds of reasons. And, um, you know, providing safe supply under the right conditions and indications, there's nothing to stop a physician from doing that at all. That's why I go back to, you know, doing your own anti-stigma work and your own work to figure out, well, what is it about this that I'm really uncomfortable with? Why do I not, you know, why do I say I don't carry a triplicate pad, for example, or why do I think that I can't prescribe something to somebody? What really is the problem here? And sometimes it lies within and sometimes it's systemic, but rarely is it because of, uh, you know, or I've never seen it to be actually a patient factor. Um, I think we can be creative and figure these things out. I think there are less barriers to the prescribers than, than we think there are. Um, and so look for, like we do with anything, you know, if I need somebody, if I need, Josh for something that he is an expert in. I look to him. I consult. That's what we do as generalists. And we should be doing that with our patients anyways. It's the same principle of standard of care, health equity. We should be figuring it out. What do our patients need and how do we get it for them, right? 
this next one I'm going to open up to uh, to the whole panel. Um, so uh, the model that uh, Dr. Mullaney proposed is exactly how the IO clinics work and they're being uh, shut down. Uh, they're comprehensive and have wraparound support. So what more can be done to save the clinics? And as a follow on question, have we heard anything yet about the outcome of the IO hearing? Well, I'm happy to start, but I others may have more to contribute than, than I do. What can we do? Um, so much of what happens around these policy decisions are uh, governed by not just funding really, but by values and beliefs and ideologies and, and people who make decisions about policy and about what should be funded and, and who should be supported are making those decisions from their own values base. And so that is a very, very difficult problem to tackle. Um, my answer is always research and evidence because I'm a researcher, but I recognize that uh, it, with many of my partners working in community agencies right now, all of the tactics that they typically use to get their agenda in front of decision makers to get change to happen, uh, nothing seems to be working right now. So we have seen good research come out of one of our colleagues at U of C on the cost effectiveness of supervised consumption clinics. That's always an argument that works with government, not works, but it resonates, right? Um, doesn't seem to be working. Uh, we presented evidence to, the, to some decision makers, the, some of the evidence that I presented today um, got no response. So I think um, what can be done, I just, I think we have to just keep pushing. We have to keep pushing that this is a, a, a public health crisis, that it is a crisis that is not going to go away based on um, sort of outdated traditional responses. We have to push the idea that addiction is a complex or substance use is a complex issue and you can't solve it with one thing or two things, that we need lots of things um, to solve this problem. And so, I, yeah, I honestly, I just think uh, we just have to keep pushing. We have to keep pushing. Um, I think in a lot of cases, empathy doesn't always work. We try to share personal uh, experiences. We try to put a human face on it. Um, but if you're a person that doesn't understand that or doesn't value that, um, empathy doesn't always work. Uh, so I always revert, what, what can we do with research and evidence? I would add to that, that um, what can we do over the next, you know, we have particular policymakers in power right now. And I know two years to me seems far away, but that is a way to make change is to vote um, and to think very carefully about where, what the policy um, agenda is for the folks that you are supporting at all levels of government. When we have an opportunity to do that, we should be thinking carefully about where, what their, their agendas and platforms are saying about uh, mental health treatment and substance use disorder and the opioid crisis. And so I would probably just add um, that at this point, I, I would throw in there um, to take a, a, a page out of our friend uh, Petra Schultz's book from Mom Stop the Harm. Um, Petra is often, um, you know, sometimes uses a sounding board and, and when talking with her and she's always given me such great advice and she says, why don't you sit down and write a letter? And so um, I would encourage folks, obviously, to do that. And, and it really is, it is about amplifying the voices of empathy and the voices that, that care. But maybe throw in there, in your letter, that piece about the cost-benefit analysis and that every $5 spent in supervised, con uh, sorry, every dollar spent in supervised consumption services saves $5 in healthcare services. Because like Dr. Milani said, um, it sometimes falls on deaf ears when making the empathy case, but then again, to make the economic case, um, but really would encourage folks to uh, write to your MPs, write to your MLAs, and let them know that this is an issue, that um, you have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in Alberta and across Canada, and that sons and daughters are, are dying across Canada, and um, these are people we love, and, and it's not just the loss of one person, because whole families are impacted, and when we're talking about the loss of life of one person, there's 20 people behind them that, that love that person. 
So there's one more question that I want to address here, um, uh, and I'll just uh, I'll focus on uh, an answer myself. So is there a resource uh, centered on myth busting or stigma reducing that we as professionals could help distribute via social media? Uh, so actually, if you go to harmdocumentary.com uh, and you click the, uh, the Act Now button, there are a number of organizations that are listed there, um, Street Cred, AWARE, uh, the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition, CAPUD, Mom Stop the Harm, Alpha House, uh, Boyle, uh, Boyle Street Community Services. Um, a lot of those organizations have resources on their websites uh, for you to explore and share. Um, the documentary itself uh, will go live on the website this afternoon um, uh, and it can be shared via a YouTube link. Uh, so all of that will be there for, for you to explore and share. Um, and, uh, and we hope that uh, this is the start of a uh, conversation that will, uh, that will continue. Um, so um, uh, I wish we had more time because there are a number of questions that we didn't get to, um, but we'll, uh, we'll collate them and, uh, and try to formulate some answers to them as well. Um, so uh, I'd like to, uh, to hand things back over to uh, Pablo Fernandez uh, to close that stage event. I think we decided to do a last minute Back. change up, Josh. Sorry about that, but- uh, Back to Stephen. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to begin by thanking Josh, Jason, and the panelists for facilitating such an engaging discussion about harm reduction, stigma, and where we can move from here. Uh, as Josh uh, so accurately put it, we will, uh, we'd like to thank all the participants for, uh, for your well thought out questions, and we will collect all the unanswered questions and share them with our panelists and filmmakers to be able to answer and then provide back to this uh, to all of you. Uh, and finally, uh, we hope you all enjoyed the screening of harm and the program today, and we hope you all have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you very much for your uh, for your support in this.